Why does it say the valley of the shadow of death? Because Mount Calvary was his death. As we walk through the life, as your life, your life should be then shadowed by Mount Calvary. It should always be pointing back to the cross. I was preparing today. I had a little scripture come up, and it's a side note. Um, 1 Peter 4, and I'm just going to read just a portion of it. And it says this in verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. Peter is writing, early 60, right before, a couple years before the, the Rome is burning. You know, and, and Nero's playing his fiddle and all that different stuff. And then the Christians are blamed and their great persecution begins to happen. Peter's writing this and he says, he says, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial. Now that's not a message that you want to hear today, right? That there's something coming ahead that's a trial. But Peter was saying, don't even think it's strange. And he goes on. And he says this, he says, But rejoice to the extent that, that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. I don't know if I'm there yet. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest with you. I like, I like my life. I like the way things are. I like... I, I like America. I love the liberty that we have and the freedoms that we have and the air conditioning that we have and the access to food that we have. I love all these different things. But if we are followers of Christ, we must understand something, that there will come a time when the fiery trials will come upon us. And it, Peter gives us the answer that we need to count it as all joy. We need, to be, we need to be excited because we're getting an opportunity to not only share in the suffering of Christ, but we're getting the opportunity to show God's glory be made manifest through us. And that is something that is going on right now, but it's not going on here. If you look around the world extensively, the persecution of the Christians has increased dramatically over the last two years. It has. And, and the, even in the last few weeks, in America, we're starting to see the inklings and the, and the, the underpinnings of what I would consider a, a religious persecution on its way. Listen, it, there are times when, whenever it ebbs and flows in, in, in the span of history where Christian and Christianity has been, a, been able to live peacefully with the world and has come under scrutiny under the world. And for the last long while, Long before I was born, or my father was born, Christianity has been able to integrate into society flawlessly. In fact, uh, maybe too much so. <laughs> Where we find maybe the, if we're not careful, we find the world in the church and the church in the world, and we can't see the difference between the two. But I really do feel as I was just praying over you, and this is not what I was going to speak on, but I felt like I needed to at least share this verse with you. That... Uh, you may find a time in our lifetime in which what you believe is no longer popular. Not only is it not only popular, it's seen as hate. And if you don't, if you're not careful, you will ebb and flow with what culture feels about Christ instead of what, what Christ feels about culture. We have to use the word of God as the anchor, as the cornerstone, the foundation, the one in which we put our life on. Because if we do not, listen, fiery trials will come. It may be as simple as, uh, it may just be as simple as uh, uh, some, one of your friends that's in the world just begins to say, man, you're nothing but a hate monger. Or I can't be with you. You, you, you say you're a Christian, 
but you, you, what, what you believe isn't love. And you'll try to, to explain to them, and then they kind of ostracize you. Or maybe it might be like in the other places of this world where it becomes, you're no longer allowed to believe that way openly. Then what we will do? Well, if we take heart, like Peter said, then what we need to do is count it all joy. That this is a part of what, who we are as Christians. You know, Christ suffered. He suffered tremendously. And when we come to Christ, we have to die to self. You know, self can't live where Christ lives. He died so that we could live, so that we can die, so we can continue that life. We have to die to ourselves. So let me encourage you, a little snippet of what God was just talking to me today. You know, don't think it's strange if you find out, you know, this summer or, or next year sometime, and you encounter someone who no longer sees Christianity as a good thing. And they begin to not only voice that opinion, but they begin to gather others around them against your Christ. Listen, it's not a reproach against you. That's what he can, if you'll ever want to read on down, he says, you know, you need to thank God that, you, that you've been reproached for the sake of Christ. But be joyful. Why? Because there's something that happens whenever someone will come against you and you just put a smile on your face and the love of Christ Jesus in your heart and you say, hey, listen, I'm praying for you. Jesus loves you. I love you. What can I do to help you? And they might be full of anger or full of this world's rhetoric. But you can come to them in truth and in love. Instead of becoming on the opposition. You know, oftentimes, and especially American culture, me included, if someone pushes you, what do you do? You push them back. And if you're really, really excited, if you think someone's going to push you, you push them first. <laughs> I'm not talking about anybody here. <laughs> But that's, listen, that's American culture. That's Western culture. That's, you know, that's, that's uh, we had that independentness in us, if I could say it that way. And it's a God-given uh, ability that our country was given to pioneer and to go into all the world. You know, missionaries would go from America with a coffin, not just 100 years ago, carrying their stuff because they knew when they were gone, that they were going to a place to die to present the gospel. It took that courage and it took that ability to, in the face of adversity, say, me and my family, we're going to Africa. And people would begin to weep and say, oh, please don't, because they knew that most every missionary that went to Africa was dead within 18 months. So they would pack everything up in the coffin and go because the call of God, it said, go into all the world and make disciples. It took... It took that American strength and resolve to pioneer that. Today, we look at Kenya, it's 85% evangelized. But we, looked, we also look today, just two generations later, and the, you know, we can still go in Africa and see the graves and the etching of these people's name that was just two generations ago. And today, you look at America, and they have no respect for what it took. We need to bring honor to whom honors and do, and we need to make sure that who we are is not who we are because of ourselves. Who we are should be who we are because of Christ Jesus. So there might be coming times, guys. I don't know. But I know if we will prepare our hearts that, listen, Christ has made a way where there seemed to be no way. He really did. And when we can get excited about our own salvation and get excited about other people's salvation, it causes us to well up with joy, not anger. That, you know, listen, the world's going to act like the world. Of course they are. They don't know Jesus. We shouldn't become offended by that. We should become excited at the opportunity to get to see the change in their life that you had. That you had. So don't, we don't have to be offended when someone comes against you and says the worst things about Christ. I mean, there's all kinds of things. There's, you know, there's, a, there's a whole galleries in, in New York that are, that, are, that are nothing but paintings of just completely tearing down Jesus. And I won't even tell you what's there. Just completely a mockery of the cross and of Christ. 
But we don't need to stand offended of that. We need to stand empowered, saying, okay, good. There's still some lost souls to be saved. And we reach out in love and in faith and in hope. That's our call. You know, we're in, a, we're in a year of transition. We're in a year of evangelism. And anyone that gets up here, they feel the weight of that. And this is what you're going to get. You're going to be equipped this year and the coming years to how to evangelize, how to share your faith, how to know who you are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because no one up here is going to have the ability to reach as far as every one of the, you can. So our only goal up here is to equip you to work the ministry and to bring glory to God. Yeah. It's not going to be from some amazing thing. Don't look at me and think I'm somebody. I'm not. I'm a nobody. This is God's portion for me to get to help you. And I do it, and I love it. But what we want to do is we want to equip you to work the ministry. All right, that was, that was my soapbox. <laughs> Hope someone gets something out of that one. That was just what I had in my heart. Um, you know, one of the most beautiful things that we're going to be talking about for the rest of eternity is the cross. One of the most... One of the strongest ways and the mechanisms by which you can reach people is to nothing more than to present the cross. You know, Paul, getting to the end of his journey, was realizing that there was many ways to be able to take down people's defenses mentally, philosophically, and he had done all those things with, uh, with brilliant. In fact, Paul was probably one of the most brilliant men on the planet. He, he, just, he just knew. He was all things to all people. He stood in the middle of it as a Christian, as Pastor Ken said. And to those who are Jewish, he would bend toward the Jewish thing and bring them in. And to those who are Gentile, he would bend this way. But he stood himself firmly in Christ. But Paul, at the end of it, he realized that he was not going to be able to talk to Gentiles about the Jewish heritage to be able to show them the things of like the Passover and see the meaning in the Passover of Christ or unleavened bread or all those different things. And he knew that they were getting, the church was getting further and further removed from its Jewish roots. And so he says this, he said, you know, I count everything that I know as not except for Christ and him crucified. So we need to understand what happened on the cross. Matthew 27, 46 presents us in a very interesting point of, the, of, of what was happening. We find Jesus already being nailed to the cross, suffering. He had already gone before Pilate. He had already been, you know, he'd already been beaten. He had already come before them. They had divided up his garments, except they didn't tear his, his priestly robe. They, uh, they divide up all his possessions. They, they cast lots for him. And, and he's nailed to the cross. And he's at this pivotal moment at the last, before he commits his, his soul to God. And he says this. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, a lot of, a lot of people get to hear that and they say, whoa, God didn't forsake Christ. Hold on. What is, what is Jesus doing right here? You know, Eli, Eli, Lama Shabbatini however you want to say it. What is Jesus saying here? Well, if you have your word, you can turn to Psalms. Let's do Psalm 22. We're just going to read just a little bit. I want to present something to you tonight. Jesus was a rabbi. That's what they called him. Rabbi Yeshua. Rabbi Yeshua. It's not just, uh, it was not just a colloquial term. It was an actual process to become a rabbi. So them calling a rabbi, he had been through this process. He had a teaching. A teaching was called a yoke. At 30 years old, you were able to have a yoke, which was called a teaching. And that's why he said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He was teaching from him, himself, what he had, what he had trained for his whole life. But at the time, if you wanted someone to know what you were talking about, you would say the first line of Psalms 22, or you would say the first of something, and your mind would fill in the rest. You know, today we do that every once in a while. We'll, uh, we'll sing part of a song, and then the other people walk away hearing the rest of the song in their brain. You know, everlasting, your light will shine. You automatically, boom, you go to it. The same thing was true when Christ was on the cross. What he was doing is we find that Psalms 22 
Psalms 23 and Psalms 24 are messianic psalms. It means they're prophetic about the coming Messiah. In Psalms 22, and this is, this is nothing more, I want you to understand this is nothing more than you to have something in your heart prepared to talk to people about because people will come against Christ in every way. They'll come against the word of God. But you know, it's really, really hard to come against something that 400 years earlier had been said to the day it was going to happen because that's the way God reveals himself. Prophecy is one of the best ways to be able to circumvent a lot of people's argument with, well, the Bible is this, the Bible is that, I don't believe this. Psalms 22 starts off and it, and it says this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, that's what he's doing. Why are you so far from help me and from the words of my groaning? You know, we can, if you ever get a time, read Psalms 22, but let me just give you some of the highlights. Uh, verse 6, it says, I am a worm. Now, if we look at the word worm there, it was a type of worm that was used to make a crimson. They would actually squish the worm, and it would become like blood red. It would come inside out. So we understand that Jesus, having his body beaten and turned inside out, he says, I am a worm. In verse 7, I am mocked. Verse 8, let him, you know, uh, let's see here. Uh, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. He, uh, let's see here. <laughs> verse 12. I'm just going to give you some highlights because I want to get somewhere tonight in the time we have. Verse 12 says this. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bastion have encircled me. Hold on. We have to understand the Hebrew, Hebraic context. Bulls were a symbol for the Pharisees. And they were surrounding around him. Verse 14 I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. Did you know that the cross, and it wasn't even invented back then, but the cross, one of the main things that it did to be able to get them to hold up on there, it would dislocate their bones. All my bones are out of joint. This is Psalms 22 talking about Matthew, Matthew 27, what was happening to Jesus on the cross. He was still in his pain and his misery. He was doing his best that day and even today to point back to say, look, see what my father has done through me. He was still doing his best. Because later on he says, God forgive them for they know not what they do. My heart is like wax, it melts. Of course we see the blood and water flowing. My strength is dried up, verse 15, the swollen tongue is what it's speaking of. Verse 16, very interesting. For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has en enclosed me. The dogs, what are those? Well, that was always symbolic of Gentiles, always. And so we see that the Romans were there encircling around him at the time. One of the most revealing ones comes right after that, and it says, they pierced my hands and my feet. You see, these are interesting things that if you know you can just bring someone to over coffee when they want to talk about something, you say, hey, listen, you know, one of the most controversial things in the Bible is when Jesus said that he was forsaken by God. And they go, yeah, <laughs> turn with me. Just would you read Psalms 22 with me? He's trying to point us somewhere. Hands and my feet were pierced. My bones are exposed, verse 18. They divided my clothes, verse 18. And we're just seeing, you're literally seeing the cross open up. Save me from the sword. And in verse 30, we'll go on down there. Or verse 31, I should say. It says, they, come, they will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. In the, in the Hebrew translation, it says this, and it is finished. It's like being Sherlock. Do you like, do you like Sherlock? Do you ever watch Sherlock or anything like that, some of the new ones? That's what the Bible is. Sometimes you can, you can go to the Bible and listen, the New Testament, everything that's in the New Testament is in the Old Testament. You know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a building on top of each other and everything is revealed. I would say anything in the New Testament you couldn't find, uh, you, couldn't, you could find a reference for of Old Testament being revealed 
It is finished because those were Jesus' final words. So what does Psalms 22 paint a picture of? It paints a picture of Mount Calvary. What does it take? You know, this is interesting because there's three Psalms here. We have Psalms 22, Psalms 23, Psalms 24. They're Messianic Psalms. Psalms 22 paints a picture of Mount Calvary. Everyone, most people know Psalms 23. You know, even, even heathens know this one. And uh, is what I always say, but it says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me by still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now hold on. Let's learn something here. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We see Psalms 22 is the Mount Calvary. We see Psalms 23 as the valley. What does a valley have to have? Two mountains. Psalms 24, we'll get there in a minute. But why does it say the valley of the shadow of death? Because Mount Calvary was his death. As we walk through the life, as your life, your life should be then shadowed by Mount Calvary. It should always be pointing back to the cross. You know, was it Psalm 61 something says, lead me to a rock that is higher than I. If you ever get a chance to go with my dad to Israel, you will understand this whenever you go out into the desert a little bit. Because there is no shade. It is hot everywhere. And what you want to find in the desert is two things, water and shade. Lead me to a rock that is higher than I so I can stand in the shadow. I can stand in its shadow from the heat. Life is like that desert. You know, it's another one, was it Psalms 103 or something? He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Somewhere around there, 100, 101, 103. Thank you, 91. <laughs> Forgive me. We have to make sure that our life, our entire life, the valley of life is enshadowed by Christ Jesus and the cross. We have to. Because if you get outside of there, listen, it is dry and it is hot and it's not refreshing. He leads us to green pastures. What is it talking about? Well, you have to understand what a shepherd would do back then. A shepherd was going from place to place looking for these little patches of green. And he would bring all his sheep there and rest. And he would look for rocks and stuff to, to, to make sure that he was in the valley at the right time of the day when he could be in the shadow of that mountain. We find that if we will let the shepherd, Christ Jesus, lead us through this life, we will always be under the shadow of Mount Calvary. But a valley takes two things. It takes two mountains. And I thought it was so cool that God revealed this. If you turn to Psalms 24. Let's see what it says here. In verse 3 it says this, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn, sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord, and the righteous of God shall be his salvation. It's talking about Mount Zion. We find that if we are in the shadow of Mount Calvary through our life, we find that we ascend the hill of the Lord to Zion. Clean hands and a pure heart, paid for by the blood of Christ. It's so neat how you can read the Bible in context and understand what Christ did, what he is doing, and what he will do for you. He paid the price at Mount Calvary. He is with you through the valley of the shadow of death as a good shepherd. His rod and his staff, they comfort you. His staff leads you around, and hopefully by the grace of God, no one has a rod moment in life. If you know what the rod is for. 
It's for those sheep who keep getting lost, so to speak, who won't listen to him. You ever seen the picture of Jesus with the little lamb? And this is that beautiful Isaiah moment. Well, hold on, why is he carrying that lamb? Because he just dislocated his leg. <laughs> Because he was getting outside. He was constantly getting outside the fence. The shepherd has both. They're corrective measures and also guiding measures. You know, Jesus is that good shepherd who leads us and guides us. I want to let you know that I was one time, I ran away from God. I know. I knew God. I knew him through Christ Jesus. And in my 20s, I got away. I literally just ran away. It's the only way to say it. it didn't, I didn't know I wasn't his. I knew I was his. I knew I was saved, but I, I, just, I just kept trying to go to other pastures, thinking I could go to somewhere, thinking I saw something that was green. You had to be careful in the desert at the time. Shepherds were so careful. One of the reasons they carried the rod around as well was because they were snakes that were always hiding the grass. And I found my share of snakes and grass I thought was good. And I remember that it cost me, I, to this day, man, I remember those things and it hurts my heart that I, that I did that knowing that Christ Jesus, what he had done for me. But I came back and I was restored. He brought me back lovingly. We can share our testimony in this life with others. But you can share Psalms 22, Psalms 23, and Psalms 24 with people and say, listen, God had a plan through Mount Calvary. He has a way and he's made it in the shadow of this world. We have to be enshadowed in him. And he has a plan for the salvation of the future. And one day, we'll all be there. Weeks ago, actually a couple months ago, when God was really speaking this into our heart. Tracy and I just spent some time just praying and meditating on the word. We were meditating on this. You know, you can sit there and pray and ask God for revelation and he'll give it to you. And this is, we're closing here. And we were just praying. We were praying over the congregation. We were praying over the word of the Lord because we, we have Bible study sometimes and we'll sit there and talk about things. And we had brought up the verse of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And just, just going through those motions and going back and God was revealing things to us. And I remember I was just praying and I was praying, God, you know, why, man, why did Jesus have to pay that much? It was so cruel. Even Jesus, even Jesus said, Lord, if there's any other way, take this cup from me, that cup of, that cup of redemption, the price that it was paid. And I was going through, because he was saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I realized that Jesus always presented God as the Father. How should we pray? My Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. You know, my Father. My Father's a good Father. He was always presenting as a Father, but on the cross he said, my God. And so I was just in that moment in prayer and I was right there in the closet and I said, God, why did he say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I realized that it was like the greatest swap that was ever done in the history. He became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteous. We couldn't call God Father. But when Christ paid the price, he took our place. And he said, my God, so that you could say, my Father. Amen. It was all about relationship. And it hit me. And then I heard this in my spirit. He said, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I heard this, for whose sake? And in a flash, it was like a mirror image of myself and I saw myself undone. For whose sake? I heard that still small spirit say, for yours, for your sake, I forsook. Oh my. And I saw the depth of my heart and the evil. The, and I saw the sin in my life. And all I could say was no. God, please no. I'm not worth it. For, his, for your sake, he forsook his son. 
And I remember I just I teared up and I told Tracy and we prayed and we cried. And we said, God, may we take that gift because you forsook so that you didn't have to forsake us for our sake. May we take that gift and share it with others because that, the way that God feels about you as a father is the way he feels about every one on this planet. For whose sake did he forsake Christ? For theirs. Would you stand? There should be a holy conviction that comes in our heart from time to time when it comes to salvation and witnessing. If you will hold fast in your heart to the truth of tonight's message, for whose sake? May it bring a holy conviction in your life as you look at people, at mothers, at fathers, at sisters, at brothers, as you look at those around you. I hope to God that you hear for whose sake. Listen. Night will come and no one will be able to work. It draws close even now. Work while there is still light. While there's still a chance. I'm going to pray for you in closing to be equipped with the holy conviction that produces in you the heart of evangelism. What got you saved? That's what will get someone else saved. Share the love of Christ for his sake. Father God, we come before you with our hearts and our hands, Lord, not to receive from any man, but Father, to receive from you tonight a holy conviction that would come on our lives, Lord God. Oh, Lord, that we would have a vision of the cross, that we would have a revelation of the suffering, that, Father God, we would have an understanding of why you forsook for our sake. God, thank you for your forgiveness. That is always there and available. But, Lord God, let us go beyond the forgiveness into repentance, Lord God, to come back to you exactly where you want us to be, to work the portion that you've given us, Lord, faithfully, to, Lord, to reach out into our schools, to reach out into our workplaces, to reach out into our community, Father God, to our neighborhoods, and to just simply share the love of Christ Jesus. For you, Father God, for their sake, Lord God, let us move forward to see your kingdom come and be made manifest on this earth through the love of Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father. I ask you to speak to us in dreams and visions, empower us and bold us, equip us, Lord God. As my Father prayed tonight for a new power, Father God, a new revelation to come on us, Father God, our infilling, a refilling of the Holy Spirit, Lord God, a power to be a witness, Father God. We want to take that and plug it into something tonight, Father God. We want to plug it into evangelism, Lord God. As Mark 16 says, Lord, let us give them the gospel and let you overwhelm them with signs and wonders, Lord God. Lord, we pray for just a harvest. We pray for the harvest, Lord God, and we pray for the harvesters, Lord God. We pray for those, Lord God, in our, Lord, that are around us, Lord God, that we can encourage the Christians around us, to, Lord, to be mindful of the season and the times. And, Father God, for those who are in the harvest, Lord, that we could reach in in love and in truth, but, Lord, with an imminency of your return, Father, to bring them to the knowledge of you as Father through Jesus. We love you. We adore you. May we worship you not only with our mouth, Lord God. May we worship you with our actions this week. In Jesus' name.